Hey guys, I just wanted to um, record something for you even though no one has showed up to office hours. So I figured what I would do is just go through a couple of things that I think are useful based off of what I think people are struggling with. Um, so I'll just be kind of screen sharing with you and going through a few different um, techniques of researching as well as how to navigate our Canvas site if that's helpful. Um, so I'm just going to turn my video off and I'll start showing you some of those things. Okay, so the very first thing that I want to go over is our Canvas site. So if you're on the home page, this is what it looks like. Um, and there's a few really important links that I want you just to be aware of. One is um, the link to our syllabus. So it just sort of has the breakdown of what's to come. Um, so hopefully you're familiar with that. But next is just the library guide for our course. And this really should be your lifeline when it comes to research. Librarians at Alexandra Library have come together and they've created and built this website for you. So you'll see at the top there are different tabs that are very useful. So if you're struggling with finding a patron, you can click this tab and you'll see that there are lots of different sources and you'll see that that's underneath funders. Um, if you're looking for a grant or a foundation, you can check there. And there's different categories in which you can search. Um, so it just goes down and it's very, very, very helpful. I recommend foundation directory online. Um, and then over here on the left hand side, there's a lot of different websites and databases listed that can help you find important statistics about your specific population, especially in your problem section when you are trying to define the population as well as the problem. I could go on for each category here, but you can sort of explore them on your own. Um, there's a lot of good resources on scholarly sources, how to cite sources, if that's something that you're struggling with. So just something to keep in mind and just a reminder that is linked right on our homepage. The other two parts of Canvas that I use most frequently are announcements. Um, and you'll see that these should go right to your email if you have it set up that way, which I think most people do. But you'll see that everything I post is really important. So here you'll see, this was um, last week, I posted a video on how to cite scholarly sources. Um, I noticed a lot of people were struggling with that, so I just posted it as a reminder. Please make sure that you're looking at these. There are often really important information points that I'm posting for you. I tell you when I've posted modules. That's how I run my whole class. I've also told you how to view feedback on assignments. A lot of my fellow professors were saying that a lot of students were struggling with that. Okay, so just going to modules. Um, this is how I structure my course. So modules are extremely important and a few things to take note of is that I divide them by week. So you'll see that week one has all of our information. This was the first week we had class. If you click on that week one outline, there are important due dates and what you need to accomplish for the specific week. Um, and then you'll see that there are a bunch of links underneath. I include screencasts, um, any documents that are important, um, any discussion threads that are important, and any documents. So I'm just gonna fast forward to um, what's sort of happening now. And week five is really where we started to delve into the midterm. So I've included my midterm lectures here. So if you click, you'll see that I have lectures posted on the midterm. Um, and I've gone through everything for those midterm requirements. Um, lastly, if you go up, you'll see that for the week five outline, um, it's asking you to read chapter five in, in the textbook because this is the chapter that goes over the midterm. So if you have not done that, if you're feeling a little confused, that is something that you should do. Um, you should be reading all of the chapters that are listed. If you go to week six, you'll see that there were more resources given on the midterm. Um, so I'm just hoping that you guys have gone through those. I've explained when peer editing is due. I've also announced peer editing groups. I had you guys fill out 
little surveys and then I took the surveys and put you guys into groups so you can see that if someone filled it out I would have their email address their name and then I would have when they're available if you did not fill this out I sent several reminders you're not in a peer editing group so please be mindful of that the other thing I just want to very quickly show you is that I've included the link here to peer editing sheets that groups are sharing with each other so I'll just show you one for instance this is what you should be doing so here's one group They've created a Google document. Um, in their case, they've created a folder and they've included all of their documents there. So just to give you another example, if you're putting it all in one document, um, you'll see here, this is just two of my students and you'll see that they've actually pasted their whole paper. Um, and this is where you're allowed to make comments and edit each other's papers. And this way I can see what you've done for peer editing. Um, so you can see here, if we look, um, just looking at two of my students, just quickly without even you know reading the papers, we have Vinny who's put his paper here. And then I have Maggie who's commenting and this is how I check your peer editing. So hopefully that's helpful for you. If I don't have access to that document, I have no way of checking whether or not you're peer editing. Um, so you should have shared that with me. I'm still missing it from a few groups from my section three. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly check and see if anyone is joining us on Zoom. Nope. Okay, so I'm still good to go. So guys, please make sure that if you're not in a peer editing group and you need to be in one, you're either one, filling out this form or you are emailing me saying, I didn't fill out the form. Can you please put me into a group? Um, a couple of other things I would just like to briefly go over is the syllabus. So you have this, it's linked in the beginning part of the home page, but there's a few things that I would like to point out to you. The midterm breakdown and as well as the whole course breakdown is here. So this is our midterm. It's 15% of our grade. And you also know how everything else is structured. The one thing I want to point out is there's a class participation grade, and that was really supposed to help a lot of people if they were struggling with assignments. Um, but what I'm finding is many people are not completing assignments the way they should be or not at all sometimes. The participation grade was meant to kind of be a buffer to help you really succeed and I'm finding that students are not doing what they need to do. So assignments and tasks that would contribute to the class participation grade are things like peer editing. So if you're doing a really good job with peer editing, that would boost your participation grade. Um, a lot of times I'll assign articles in the Magrino textbook as well as questions that correlate with them doing those questions thoughtfully help you build your participation grade not doing them takes away same with peer editing and lastly i've asked you to write a reflection on the alred text and that also helps you build your participation grade so i'm hoping that that clarifies uh, those assignments are not graded but i look at the quality of the work that you are completing and that's what helps me decide where you are so if you're missing all of those questions you're not peer editing you're probably going to earn zero points for class participation when that really should have been a pretty easy grade to earn so i'm hoping that that clarifies the last thing that i want to go over um well, I want to point out a few more things here. So just in case you are struggling with the midterm, please watch the lectures. Please read all of the resources. I have a PowerPoint here that goes over the requirements. If you read the chapter for the midterm, it goes over this way more specifically. It's chapter five in the Magrino textbook. Um, the midterm sales letter rubric, there's a rubric here for you. There's also um, a midterm exemplar. I spent a lot of time annotating the exemplar and giving feedback to one of my students from a few years back just so you can sort of see the structure I've highlighted all of the statistics in orange so you can just get a sense of how much the student is citing I've also just given you feedback for how long things should be I've labeled them here's his problem section I've talked about titles and it goes on um, and then we talk about his paradigm section we talk about how that is sectioned off it transitions into his plan section. And then, sorry, it's out of order, going into the closing of his plan, the price, and then his closing, um, and then it would go up to the works cited and down. What I've noticed is a lot of people are not 
structuring their work cited properly, you want to make sure that you're using MLA 8th edition. This is exactly how it should look. It's alphabetized. You'll see that it's double spaced. If the citation goes beyond the first line, every line besides the first is indented. So you can see that the first one is two. So that second line is indented. This second citation is four lines. So the um, three lines after the first are indented. This is really important. Um, please make sure that you guys are looking at your works cited pages because I did see a lot of structural issues with them. Okay, I'm just going back to the library um, homepage and this is what it looks like. And I think a lot of people are also struggling with finding scholarly sources. So I've been meeting with several of you and I'm really happy about that. A lot of people have reached out and told me when they're available. And I've met with probably 10 to 15 of you um, in your own time. And I've tried to make it work with your schedule because I know how busy you are. So just to give you a very brief example of how to find a scholarly source since a lot of people are struggling with that i'm just going to use one of the examples that one of you are writing about which is um student athlete mental health so what i'm going to do here is just a very quick search using quick search is kind of the best way I can describe it is it's like going to Walmart or Target, like there's a little bit of everything there. But if you want more specific databases for your topic, you would probably click here because they have databases that are specific to education, that are specific to science, that are specific to social work, and they will have way more. So this is a good place to start, but then I might branch out there just so you can find more specific articles. So if I'm talking about the mental health of student athletes, I might start my search by student athlete and I would do an asterisk here. You do an asterisk if you're trying to get everything. So this would give you athlete as well as athletes. So that's what that asterisk does. If you're using a phrase, you put it in quotations. Here I'm just going to put mental health. This is a really broad search, okay? Um, it could be way more specific, but I'm just showing you a quick search just to show you how you can narrow your search. So if I click the search button, you'll see that it takes some time loading. And you'll see that I have just about 5,000 results. So I just wanna show you how I would narrow that. This is the most important thing where it says limit to. If you click peer reviewed journals, you are guaranteeing that all of your results are scholarly. This means that now you have 1,200 results that are scholarly sources. So if you're struggling with finding scholarly sources or you're not sure what they are, you just don't understand, they are peer reviewed journals. So by clicking that option, peer reviewed journals, you're guaranteeing that everything here is a scholarly source. Another thing you might want to do is narrow it to just articles that are in English because that's most likely what you'll be reading in. And then another good way to narrow it would be the date. We don't really want articles from 1940 because that's so long ago. So I always tell students go in the last year or the last two years. Just for the sake of our search, I'll just do the last year. So I'm changing it to 2019 to 2020. And you'll see we have 266 articles. One of the last techniques that could be useful for you is clicking the down arrow on subject. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you'll see that there are different subjects that are brought up in these articles. So I might click a few of these that are interesting. I might click student athletes and mental health. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I'm seeing if anything else looks interesting and maybe education. And then I'll click apply filters. So we went from having about 500, sorry, 5,000 articles and now we're down to 100, which is much more manageable. The next thing you should do, you're knowing now that all of these are scholarly, which is good because I think a lot of you need those scholarly articles. But if you click a link, you will see that there's a lot of resources here that are helpful. If you're struggling with the citation, you can click this little citation button, make sure that it's on MLA 8th, and you'll see it cites it for you. And it's in that proper structure. It should just be in Times New Roman font, but there it is. We know that it's coming from the journal Clinics and Sports Medicine. We see that volume number. We know the publication date, the page number, um, and the article title. You'll see that in order to get the full text, you would click this arrow, 
But down here is really important. You'll see that there's a description section and that description section gives you a very brief summary or overview of the entire article. That way you don't have to waste your whole time uh, reading this long lengthy article that's oftentimes very complex. You can read this and see if it's what you want. If it is, looking at these subject terms might be helpful. They'll help you search for articles that are similar. Um, but once you're ready and you're thinking, this is the article, I finally found it, you will make sure that you are getting it. So you click that little arrow and it will bring you here. And normally there is some sort of a little link to a PDF and you'll see that that's right here. So if I click download the PDF, here it is for me. And now I have my article. Okay, so I'm hoping that this was helpful for you. Um, please let me know if you guys need anything else.